I'm Dr. Raghuram. I'm with Infectious Disease, and today we're going to talk about some basics of HIV infection. Um, try to do a good mix of what you would see on boards with real life, so hopefully this is helpful. So we are going to discuss um, all these aspects of HIV infection, epidemiology, pathogenesis and transmission, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. So we're going to start with a case, okay? So Joe is your new patient. So he's a 23-year-old male who comes to establish care with you as his new PCP. His partner is also your patient, and he recommended Joe come see you. So Joe identifies as a male who has sex with males, MSM, and he endorses unprotected receptive anal and oral intercourse. His last HIV test was about um, six months ago, and he says it was negative. He's feeling fine right now, but every now and then he seems to think that he has some axillary and cervical lymphadenopathy over the last several months. So astutely, you decide to test him for HIV. So these are the results here, okay? Give you a chance to read all that. All right. So what's your next best step? Do you repeat the test? Do you call Joe and inform him of the results over the phone, offer you an appointment if he needs it, reassure him that you're going to refer him out to a specialist as soon as possible, answer whatever questions he may have? Or do you call Joe in for an appointment to discuss the results in person? During that appointment, you're going to offer reassurance, say you're going to refer him, answer whatever questions he may have. Or you could do either B or C. So I'm going to do show of hands. Um, who, anyone vote for A? Are you confident of the test results? We're cool that this is positive HIV? No takers for A. What about B? No Bs. How about C? Okay, some Cs. What about B or C? You could do either. You could do it in person, over the phone. I see some, <laughs> some folks are like, I don't know. Okay. So um, for me, the best answer would be to discuss the results in person, and I'm going to walk you through why that is the recommendation currently. So these recommendations are kind of old. They're from 2006, but that's the most updated that we have in terms of um, screening and um, testing. So the recommendations say that HIV negative results are fine to give over the phone. Um, that's fine. You don't need the direct personal contact. However, positive results really should be confidentially through personal contact with a practitioner. Okay, so that's a, that's a suggestion, but that's the thing I've come across. Um, some internists, they're like, oh, you know, I do positive results over the phone. Ideally, uh, you should do positive results face-to-face, -face. okay? All right, so let's go into a little bit of the epidemiology of HIV so you can understand the global impact um, of what we're dealing with. So this is um, the data from 2016 from the WHO. Um, and this is um, the number of people estimated to be living with HIV. And if you look at the total number here, it's close to 37 million, right? If you look at the Americas, we have about 3.3 million folks with HIV. And of course, the darker the color here, the higher the density. So if you compare it to Africa, you have 25 million um, folks here with HIV. Um, as far as people dying from HIV-related causes, the total worldwide is around a million um, from that latest data. And, of course, you see disparities here in the numbers. If you look at the Americas, about 54,000. If you look at Africa, you have 720,000. As far, this slide is really busy and really tiny, but I'm just going to give you the skinny on this. In terms of people living with HIV, those numbers have gone up over time. You look at 27 million over to 37 million. However, the new HIV infections have actually decreased over time. You started out with 2.8 million in the 2000, um, and now you're down to 1.8 million. And this is the impact of ART, antiretroviral therapy. And again, if you look at AIDS-related deaths, that's also also come down some from one and a half million to nine forty thousand. Still a lot of deaths there. Um, and you look at folks uh, accessing ART, and you have uh, a number of six hundred eleven thousand here, and more recently twenty one million. So uh, those that trend in increasing the use of ART is helping in uh, decrease the number of total new infections. So that's a good thing. 
This is a map showing you the impact of HIV here in the U.S. You can see here in Kentucky, we're not we're in the lighter blue, so we're not really a hotbed of HIV. But if you look at some other states here, if you look at Georgia, and then um, D.C. is actually one of the highest density states that with HIV. Um, again, here Nevada, uh, Florida, their higher density of HIV cases. And then if you look at the distribution of the risk groups, this is still a disease of disparities. If you look here, the highest risk group is blacks, male-to-male -male sexual contact. You can see here the, the number of cases, new diagnosis in these populations as of 2016. Um, and even when you look at women, black women with heterosexual contact also are, are leading here when compared to white and Hispanic women. So still a disease of disparity. So let's go into the HIV life cycle a little bit so you can understand where all the drugs work um, and how this virus works. So we know this is a retrovirus, right? So that the name tells you it does things backwards. So instead of having a nice, pretty DNA strand making an RNA, you have the opposite. You have two strands of RNA, and somehow that virus has to make DNA, which is the language your whole cell is going to understand, right? So it does this backwards process using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. But the first phase is really the virus has to fuse with the host cell and enter that host cell, and then all of this kicks off. So we do have fusion and entry inhibitors. We have a couple of drugs in that class. They're not mainstay of treatment because we need some additional tests to make sure those drugs would work for your patient. And also, although they stop new viruses getting into new cells, we have HIV reservoirs that are formed um, very quickly, and it, those drugs don't affect those latent dormant viruses, okay? So once the virus um, gets in here, it's going to use its reverse transcriptase to make your DNA from RNA. And we can stop that enzyme by two, drug, two classes of drugs that we have, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and non-nukes. Um, those drugs work blocking the same enzyme just a little bit differently. Nucleosides are fake base pairs, and that's how they stop the enzyme from making the whole strand. Um, and non-nukes are just going to bind to the enzyme and block it completely. So they work the same enzyme, just different ways. If this process keeps going on, the virus is going to make DNA, and that DNA gets integrated into the host DNA by an integrase, so pretty straightforward, and we have integrase inhibitors that block this step. Once this happens, though, um, this is what establishes a chronic infection. Now you have a virus that is integrated into the host um, cell DNA, and it's going to use and hijack the whole cell machinery to make its own proteins. And once it does that, you have these long protein chains here. There are multiple individual proteins that have function, but they're all stuck together. So something has to come and break those apart so that they can make an active baby virus. And the enzyme that does that is a protease, and we can block the protease with protease inhibitors. Without this step, the virus really cannot mature into a new virus, all right? So that's where, that's how the life cycle works, and that's all the steps that we can block um, with medication, all right? So as far as the pathogenesis, once this whole process happens, it's infected the cell, you have established a chronic infection, you essentially have establishment of infection in lymphoid tissue, the initial phase, you're going to have massive viremia, right? The virus is replicating at high speed, and it's going to disseminate into your lymphoid organs. Your immune system, meanwhile, is trying to control that, and it's successful partially for some time. So for up to eight years or so, your immune system can kind of put the brakes on the virus, but at some point it loses that fight and the virus takes over. And by that time, that's when you establish the complete destruction of your CD4 cells and your immune system. Okay? 
So as far as clinical manifestations, it's really a multi-organ system disease. We often think of it as just affecting the immune system and giving rise to opportunistic infections, but that's not the case. Um, there's a lot of evidence for a high degree of inflammation, which then is going to affect coronary um, artery disease. It can cause glomerulonephritis and renal insufficiency, can affect bone density, it can affect vitamin D. It can cause vitamin D or contribute to vitamin D deficiency. Of course, central nervous system involvement with cognitive uh, function impairment and neuropathies. And, of course, can also contribute to hyperlipidemia. So it's, it is truly a multi-organ system disease. And these days, while we have our patients on good um, treatment, they are living longer and they're you know, getting to those ages where they have these comorbidities going on. And even if you suppress the virus, for the most part, you're going to help prevent some of this, but even suppressed viral loads can still have that inflammatory component there that contributes to all of these. All right, so let's talk about transmission now. So Joe, your patient, has some questions, right? He's asking, what is the approximate risk of HIV transmission when engaging in receptive anal intercourse uh, unprotected, right? So what do you guys think? Do you think it's 1.5%? Is it 3%, 5%, 10%? Any takers for A, 1.5%? Show of hands. Couple people. Uh, what about 3%? few people, okay, going for the mid. <laughs> what about 5%? Some people over there. And 10%, anybody think it's 10? Not really. Okay, so the answer to this one is 1.5%, one so good job. So here I took this table from up to date, and I did the favor of calculating the actual percentages here by the side. So if you look at blood-borne exposure, truly blood transfusion with contaminated blood is the highest transmission risk. That's 90%, which is evidently why we have screening of blood products, right, before we, we give them to people. Um, if you look at needle-sharing injection drug use, that's 0.6% risk. A percutaneous needle stick, occupational exposure, it's 0.3%. And if you look at mucous membrane exposure, exposure so uh, to blood, so blood splash to your eye, for example, that's a 0.1% risk. Um, so those are like the, in, in the risks for these blood-borne exposures. Now, if you look at sexual exposure, receptive anal intercourse does carry the highest risk because you are having a breakdown of mucous membranes there. So um, it is 1.4%, so the 1.5, I rounded up in the question. Um, for insertive anal, not receptive, it is considerably lower, 0.1%. And if you look at the other forms, it is even lower. So truly, that is the highest risk. Now, other things like biting, spitting, throwing body fluids, um, sharing sex toys, that transmission is negligible. All right, so let's look at the diagnosis. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is that there are universal screening recommendations since 2006 for HIV. This is since 2006, and I still feel that this is underdone uh, in the community. So the CDC said we need to test everybody between these ages at least once as a part of routine health care. They picked that cutoff of the age with the understanding that if you had it for all this time, you you know, beyond that age, you are at a lower risk. Um, again, once in a lifetime, test test people. Um, so that's once in a lifetime. There are certain groups that you should test at least once a year. So those are these groups here so that have risk factors. So MSM, if you have um, HIV positive partner, if you've had more than one sex partner since your last HIV test, if you're injecting drugs, using needles, exchanging sex for drugs or money, if you had or were treated for another STD, if you got diagnosed with tuberculosis or hepatitis, or partners have unknown sexual history. Those are considered high-risk groups. So those you should test at least annually. And within those groups, some experts even suggest that for MSM, um, you may need to test every three to six months. But for now, at least annually for those groups. Okay. 
So let's go to a new question. So you're seeing a new patient. She tells you, hey, you know, I, have a, I had a scare with HIV a month or so ago. Um, they did a screening test that came out positive, and I was freaking out, but then the, they told me the confirmation test was negative. So I, I was really relieved because I did have a new partner, unprotected sex, about a month before, and I was kind of feeling off. I had a sore throat and a rash and a fever, and that's why my doctor tested me. But now I feel great. I have nothing going on. Um, you know, everything went away. So how would you counsel this patient? Would you say, since the confirmation test was negative, there's nothing to worry about? Her screening test was a false positive. Would you say, since her confirmation test was negative, there's nothing to worry about? It was a false positive, but you should retest her if she has new exposures or risk factors. Or do you think her discordant tests re represent acute HIV and we should get an HIV viral load to help determine if that's the case? Or her discordant tests could represent H acute HIV, but we should just retest in three to six months because sometimes those, those initial tests take a while to become positive. So what do you guys think is the best option here? Um, I think your first step is figuring out, is there a possibility this is acute retroviral infection, or do you think it's a false positive? Because then you cut off two options right there. Um, so let's go. Who Do we have any takers for A? Nope. How about B? Nope. Okay, good. So you made the right decision. <laughs> so is it C or is it D? Any takers for C? Everyone's thinking, what about D? So some, most people think you should get retested. Okay, so the actual answer here is you do need to get a viral load here. So let's go into the details of that and kind of explain how the testing is done and what each part of the testing means. So let's talk about the standard diagnostic test for HIV. So normally, the screening test that we do is an ELISA. Okay, and I will talk about the different generations of ELISA. And for confirmation, we use a couple different options. Um, the most utilized option today is this confirmation test, which is an antibody differentiation test. And it's called the Genius with two E's because it's really smart. The other one is the good old Western blot. Um, a lot of people in, that rotate with me in clinic, they have always heard of the Western blot, but not necessarily about the Genius. The Genius test has been, we've been using for at least a couple years now. Um, before that, they had a similar test, which was called a multi-spot, which is 2014-ish. Um, we don't usually uh, tend to use Western blots as much anymore because they're very, very labor intensive and they have a delayed turnaround time. So truly, most people are using Genius for confirmation. I don't know that that's the answer that they will ask on the boards because it is fairly recent. So if you see a Western blot option there, that's okay to pick that one. All right. <coughs> So let's talk about ELISAs. Um, most of you know how an ELISA is going to work. So basically you have a known antigen in a well in the lab, and you're putting your patient's blood in here. If your patient happens to have antibody to what you're looking for, that antibody is going to attach here, right? Problem is you can't see it. So you're going to put an anti-antibody and a color substrate with an enzyme, and then if everything connects and all the stars align, this is going to change color. And that's how you visually see that that test was positive. So that's an ELISA. So we have four generations of ELISA. So right now we're using the fourth generation, and that's what people talk about when they're saying, oh, I did a fourth generation ELISA. So let's walk through all the ELISAs that, are, that have been there. So the first generation ELISA, the only thing it detected was HIV type 1 IgG. So you can imagine the window period is, would be very long because by the time you form IgG antibodies after you've had to form IgM, it's going to take a while. So that was the first generation. The second generation, they improved the technology a little bit. They also added HIV-2 in here, but still only detecting IgG. So even though it was a little bit better as a test, your window period was still 42 days. So that's a pretty long time. 
So the third generation was the first HIV test that included IgM. So you can imagine if you're detecting IgM, your window period is going to shorten drastically, right? Because IgM comes first, you're able to pick that up. So now you have a window period coming down to 22 days. Um, so the next step was the fourth generation. I want to say that came out maybe in 2013, 14. And the added step here is that besides doing everything that the third generation does, HIV 1 and 2, IgG and IgM, it's also detecting an antigen. So that's why, why this is also referred to as a combination antibody antigen test or a combo test. That's because you're looking for both antibody and antigen. And the antigen that they're looking for is called P24, and that's part of the core capsid of the HIV. And it'll be at highest levels in the beginning of infection, so it's a marker of early infection. So this really shortened that waiting period even further. So about two weeks, two to three weeks is the median time it takes to become positive. Now, when we do this test and it comes back positive, like our patient Joe, all you know that is that it's positive. You don't know which component is necessarily positive. Is it IgM? Is it IgG? Is it P24? Clinically, it doesn't really matter much other than to if you knew you could kind of figure out if it's a more acute infection. But in clinical terms, it doesn't change your management. But there is a fifth generation that's going to come out, and it's, it's basically the fourth generation, but telling you which component is positive, okay? And this is how that fourth generation works. So you can see here is your well, right, your ELISA well, and they kind of plop everything together, all your known quantities together in that well. So if, if you're looking for antibodies, you're going to have antigen on the bottom, right? And if you're looking for an antigen, you have to have that antibody on the bottom. So you have all these things all kind of bundled together, and you throw the patient's blood in there, and whatever sticks, sticks, and it will change color, and that's the, the red little wells you're seen here. So that's the fourth generation test. This is um, a description of both the multi-spot and the genius test. You can see the multi-spot stopped being made in 2016 because it was only looking for um, two HIV-1 proteins, antibodies, um, and those were actually the same one, and one HIV-2 antibody. So they wanted something that was looking for more things. So that's when they came up with the genius, and the genius looks for four <coughs> antibodies for HIV-1 and two antibodies for HIV-2. I do want to emphasize HIV-2 is not a very prevalent here in the U.S., the only place in the world is really West Africa. We do have a couple of patients in clinic who um, immigrated, uh, but it's not something very prevalent. The course seems to be a little more indolent. The transmission's the same. And the other difference management-wise is that one class of drugs does not work for it, which is the non-nucleosides. They don't work for HIV-2. But again, it's not something I expect you to come across very frequently here um, in the U.S. So they improved the genius test. This guy's out. We're using this for confirmation. And it's not a simple card read test, and it doesn't look like an ELISA. There's actually a cassette. You put the blood in there and a buffer, and you wait, and then you stick it in this reader, and the reader is what tells you the result. So it's not like uh, you're, you're looking for the result. The machine is interpreting the result for you by comparing the bands of proteins that they're seeing in, in that cassette, okay? This is a good old Western blot just to remind you all how laborious it was. You know, you have to do gel electrophoresis and blot it and then label the antibody and then stain it and then look for the bands here and then you would get a result sort of like this telling you how many bands, right? So that's the Western blot. Um, and this is just kind of telling you the timeline to positivity of each test. So the first test to become positive after exposure is going to be your HIV viral load because you're having active viral replication. So that's the first thing that's going to become positive, okay? Within 7 to 14 days of infection, you should have detectable HIV viral load. The next thing to become positive is that P24 um, antigen we talked about. So that between, um, by two weeks, um, you have high levels of that. Third thing to become positive is your IgM. 
And the last thing to become positive is your IgG. By 12 weeks after infection, most people have seroconverted to IgG. Okay, so that's kind of the sequence. And now it makes sense why the test can be discordant, right? Because your, your um, P24 antigen and your ELISA become positive quicker than your multi-spot, your genius, and your western blot, okay? So the western blot is the one that takes the most time. So that's why you can have discordant tests in a very early infection because this will be positive because it's really early, but this didn't have time to become positive yet. So anytime you have discordant tests, you need to figure out if that's an acute infection versus a false positive. So you need to do your viral load as a tie break anytime you have a discordant test, okay? This is just kind of explaining the same thing, how the tests become positive at different points. And this is the algorithm from the CDC, which essentially reinforces what I just said. If you have a negative test here, the, the initial test, which is the, your ELISA, then you kind of stop um, there. Um, if you have a positive and then these ones are positive, you kind of have your answer. But if you have a positive and a discordant here, either negative or indeterminate, you do your tiebreaker, okay? So that's something very important to keep in mind, even in clinical practice. Now, Joe, is we're coming back to Joe, and Joe's confused about what his test results below mean. And he also wants to know, does he have AIDS? And so I'm going to interpret these for you. So this is the HIV fourth generation ELISA test. That came back positive. This test here is the genius test. It's, the an, it's an antibody test as well, but looking for those targets that I showed you. So you can see that it came back positive for HIV-1, and it came back negative for HIV-2. And just in case you still were confused, they did the interpretation here for you. So this is truly a positive test. But can you answer Joe's question? Does he have AIDS? So any takers for A, B, and C, this one's kind of easy. <laughs> okay, good. So you know that you can't tell that because you need to know what the CD4 is, right? So let's talk about that. So this is the natural progression of the CD4 counts and viral loads without ART. If you look at the red line, the, the red line here is the CD4 count. You see that very early on infection, you start with a normal CD4 count. You kind of have a precipitous drop, which is short-lived, and eventually you reset your uh, CD4 count set point. After that, it stays pretty stable for a good amount of years until it starts to steadily decline along several years. Eight years is kind of the usual thing. When you look at the viral load, it's kind of the opposite, right? In the beginning, you have a huge peak here with millions of in viral load copies per ml. That, then your immune system kicks in, and that kind of drops and stays stable until you start your immune system is losing its fight then that viral load kind of shoots up again. With ART, you're going to have basically stabilization of both those counts because the virus will be suppressed, okay? And for AIDS, the criteria is CD4 less than 200 or a CD4 percent less than 14 percent. And that's why for anyone who's rotated with me in the 550 clinic, They'll see me always write the absolute and the percent. Most of the time, these numbers will kind of be equivalent. You know, a 200 CD4 is usually going to be at least 14%, but sometimes you have discordance there. So it's either or, all right? And this is another graph depicting the same thing I already said. Okay, so Joe has a couple more questions. First of all, he's reluctant to tell his current partner about his new HIV diagnosis. He tells you that they've been living together for the last 18 months. They're, they're in an open relationship by mutual agreement. They know about each other's other partners. Um, and so he's, he's kind of reluctant. And Joe's partner, if you haven't forgotten by now, is also your patient because that's who referred him to you. Okay? So what do we do with this? So is Joe and his partner are not legally married, so you cannot tell the partner about Joe's diagnosis. Option B is you can't tell him about Joe's diagnosis at all because of HIPAA, of course. Or C, in the state of Kentucky, 
A few fields medically necessary and the couple has cohabitated for a year or more, you are protected by law if you disclose to Joe's partner. Or D, in the state of Kentucky, if a couple has cohabitated for a year or more, you are protected by law if you decide not to disclose to Joe's partner, or you could do either C or D. So this, these are questions that come up in real life. No one's going to ask you this on the boards, but it's just something that comes up. So do I have any takers for A? No. Okay. How about B? Got some takers for B. Okay. What about C? Mm, and D? Mm, or C and D? Okay. So <laughs> a lot of people uncertain about this question. So actually C or D, um, there is legislation for that. I pasted the whole legislation, but I'm going to summarize it for you. So. If you have a patient who's HIV positive and they identify their partner to you, okay, and, it, it, and the partner doesn't have to be your patient, by the way, if they refuse to disclose and they've been living together for more than a year, you can, you, you have two options. You're protected by law if you feel that it's your duty, your medical civil duty to disclose to the partner, you're protected by law. If you decide not to disclose, you're protected by law. So you have the option. Um, I've only rarely come across this situation, and in, in that case, what I've done, I've discussed that with the patient. I've said, you know, there is legislation that allows me to disclose to your partner if I feel this is in their best interest. So I can do that, and I'll probably do that if you're not able to. Most of the time when I say that, they're like, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll let them know, and, you know, and uh, often they bring the partner to the next appointment or uh, or to get tested. So that's just um, the disclosure statute in Kentucky. So Joe decides that, okay, he's going to go ahead and disclose to his partner. His partner's Jake, who's already your patient, and he comes in for an appointment to get tested. You went ahead and tested Jake, um, did his uh, ELISA, his confirmation, and his viral load, because Joe's viral load was like 899,000 copies. Both are fine, both are negative for Jake, okay? So Joe's positive, but Jake's negative. So Joe and Jake were Googling and came across some articles about a pill to prevent HIV transmission in high-risk patients. How do you counsel them? One, that the daily pill to prevent HIV is available. Studies on efficacy have had mixed results, so that's why it's not standard of care. Or you think that B, a daily pill to prevent HIV has proven efficacy in high-risk populations. Or C, a daily pill to prevent <coughs> HIV is efficacious. However, standard use led to a marked increase in other STDs because folks were not using protection, thinking that they had this other layer. And so this approach has now fallen out of favor. Or gently or strongly, whichever you want to do, whichever is your style, admonish your patients for trusting Dr. Google because there's no such thing. So um, any takers for A? Okay, what about B? Okay, we have some, okay. What about C? Do you think that's happened? Don't know. D, anybody, that, that was a joke. Okay, so um, yes, there is um, daily pill to prevent HIV transmission, and that's what we call PrEP uh, or HIV PrEP. So let's talk about that. So PrEP has been proven to be effective in high-risk populations. Currently, we only have one medication approved for this, and that's a combination of two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, or NRTIs, and that's tenofovir and emtricitabine. Um, tenofovir has a newer formulation that is easier on your kidneys and on your bone. Um, however, this newer formulation has, has all these advantages, but there was some um, concern because the, the reason why it has less side effects is because it has less systemic concentration. So the concern was, will it get an, uh, achieve high enough levels in the genital area and other tissues where you have the initial contact with HIV? So that newer formulation is still being studied for PrEP. So right now we just have this one, okay? And there are some risks with long-term use, as I mentioned, renal insufficiency or osteoporosis, but this is usually well-tolerated. 
We started doing PrEP at the 550 clinic probably uh, about a year ago. Um, and, you know, this is an ongoing risk assessment. If you're on PrEP today, it doesn't mean you're going to be on PrEP forever, right? You're always reassessing that patient's risk. Do they still have the risk factor or not? And that's how you decide how long they will be on PrEP. Um, I just put out the newest guidelines that were updated in 2017, just last year, so you can see which are the risk groups that are considered high risk. So males who have sex with males, um, and so that is um, one of the risk groups. If they've had a recent bacterial STI, high number of sex partners, or inconsistent or no condom use. For heterosexual groups, it's pretty much the same um, indications, and folks who inject drugs um, also are a high-risk group. So you can use this. Um, you have to do a lot of the baseline testing, first of all, because the biggest thing is making sure they're HIV negative, correct? Because or else they're not a candidate for PrEP, and you have them on two drugs instead of three, etc. So I'm going to kind of fast forward, because I already see the next lecture is here. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through the treatment options. So Joe wants to know what are the treatment options. Of course, I'm not going to go into detail on in all this, just going to show you so you can see. So now we have 10 once-a-day options, which is very exciting, and some of these have just come out in the last 18 months or so. So these are all the single tablet regimens. When I was a fellow, we had just one, and I was a triplet. So this is huge. Um, we have all these drugs in this class. And in our TI class, we have other drugs. Integrase inhibitors are the newest kids on the block, and they are the ones that bring down the viral loads very quickly. So we have these. Um, protease inhibitors, those are all our proteases and our entry inhibitors, and the newest kid on the block here is this Trogarzo or Ibilizumab, and that's a monoclonal antibody that actually works inhibiting the binding site when the virus is trying to get in the cell. So this is brand new, and it's shown promise in multi-drug resistant populations, okay? Uh, the usual formula we use is a backbone of two NRTIs with a base. The recommended base for naive patients who have never been on treatment before is an integrase inhibitor. So typically you use three active drugs. Okay, so that's our formula. Boards are going to at most ask how many drugs you use, and that is three active drugs. A couple of management pearls, which I'm going to go through. Um, which of the following tests are usually performed as baseline for newly diagnosed HIV-positive patients? Is it A, HLA, B, 5701, and genotype? Is it B, tropism and phenotype? Is it C, geno and pheno? Is it B and C, or is it none of them? Anyone want to, any takers for A? Oh, everybody's unsure about this one. B, nobody. C, Okay, um, D, nope, and E, okay, everybody's unsure, but the correct answer is this. I'm very quickly going to go through this. So for HLA-B5701, this has to do with the drug abacavir. So abacavir is a good option, but it can cause a hypersensitivity reaction. That usually happens about six weeks after starting it. And with time, we figured out that folks that had this gene positive had a higher risk of a back of your hypersensitivity reaction. Therefore, we do do this at baseline for all our patients, okay? Um, this is the distribution. It is predominantly a Caucasian gene. Um, and you can see here, Sub-Saharan Africa, less than 1% predominance. And where you look at United Kingdom, 8%. But a large variability in some areas of the world. So here, 5 to 20%. This is the genotype. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. The genotype is the test we use to determine resistance. That's the test we use the most. And this is based on comparison to a vast database that we have. Um, all the labs in the country that do this test have the sequence of what we call wild type, which is the virus with no resistance. And they match up your patient's virus to that wild type virus and look where it's different. So based on this, among all, along all these years, we've accumulated huge amounts of information. They're able to say, oh, 
this change here means that this drug will not work. So that's a genotype, okay? I'm going to skip this. A phenotype is a little bit more specific. So here, you're getting your patient's virus, and you're actually transfecting a cell. Then you're getting a bunch of wells with each HIV drug, and you're sticking your patient's virus in there. And you're going to see how well each drug kills your patient's virus. So that's essentially like an MIC for our urine culture, E. coli, susceptible to this, resistant to that. That's what a phenotype is. Um, so you can ask me, well, this test sounds a lot better than the genotype because it's your patient's virus, so why don't we use a phenotype? So what's your guess? It's more it expensive, right? And I can usually get the information I need from my genotype. So I only do a phenotype if something's not working right and the genome's telling me that all the drugs are working. That's when I would do a phenotype. Um, okay, four more, no, three more minutes. So the last thing I want to talk about is this other clinical scenario. So this is Johnny. He's Joe and Jake's friend. He's already a patient of the 550 clinic. He was diagnosed with HIV after having pneumocystis pneumonia. He got treated, completed treatment, and he started his ART. Three weeks later, he's got a cough, a fever, and shortness of air. The chest x-ray looks like bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. And he's saying, I'm taking my medicine. And you check his numbers, and they look good. It was CD4 of 50, now it's 150, and viral load started out at 370,000, and now it's down to 950. So he is taking his medication. So what do you think is going on here? Do you think his uh, pneumocystis is back because the ART is failing? Do you think this is immune reconstitution? Do you think this is a completely different infection? Or do you think this is good old community-acquired pneumonia? Any takers for A? B, Mac, anybody? No. And what about pneumonia? Some people for pneumonia here and there. So this is actually iris. Um, so we'll talk just about this and we'll go from there. So iris is really a paradox because it's worsening of a pre-existing OI after you start ART. Because before ART, you didn't have an immune system. You didn't know you had to fight anything. Now you have an immune system, and maybe you had a, a subclinical infection that now your immune system is hitting, or you had lingering antigens from an old infection, and that's triggering a, an inflammatory response. So the people more at risk are people who start out with a CD4 50 or less, and that after ART, their CD4 goes up to above 100. So they're more at risk for this in immune reconstitution syndrome, and the hallmark is really an exacerbated inflammatory response. So the challenge for us ID physicians is figuring out, is this a new infection or is this just iris because the treatments are different? For a new infection, you've got to treat it. For iris, you've got to ride it out and sometimes add steroids to help with inflammation, okay? Um, biopsies and tissue really help out your ID physician here because if it's iris, you will not see organisms in there, um, and you will see more inflammation as opposed to finding organisms that are causing disease, okay? I'm going to skip all that. Main point here, you need to continue ART. You never stop ART with iris, okay? You manage the complication, but you do not stop ART, and that is a board question, okay, for you guys. Um, I am going to skip some of this, too. The main point to remember about live vaccines, if your CD4 is above 200 and above 15%, you're okay to get live vaccines. Um, these here are approved as long as your CD4 um, follows those parameters. Um, and these are the live attenuated, uh, I'm sorry, not live, inactivated attenuated are all fine for um, HIV positive. The Shingrix is the newest uh, inactivated vaccine for zoster. There's not enough data yet for HIV positive, so there's not a recommendation yet about using it, although it sounds like it would be a good thing. And um, patient monitoring is essentially renal function, your analysis, your viral load, and your CD4. Most people get to undetectable by 6 to 12 months. 
Um, be aware of uh, over-the-counter medication interactions. Always check those because some, something as simple as an inhaled steroid might have an interaction with some ART. Always task me or anybody else at the 550 clinic. We're happy to check that for you. So HIV today is still a disease of significant global impact, but our treatment options are extensive and very well tolerated. So folks are having a normal life expectancy. The real challenge is helping patients achieve compliance, and that is is really treatment is easy. Uh, I swear, it's easy. It's getting patients to be compliant, which is the challenge. Um, And otherwise, it's a chronic disease with excellent prognosis when folks are compliant. All right, that's all I got. Thank you.